as Brendan so indiscreetly hinted, I've been around a while. <laughs> and uh, at one point or another, and at one, cap in one capacity or another, I've uh, had the pleasure of working closely with pretty much all the conservation organizations on this island. So I've seen them come, and I've seen them go. And I've seen the flux in staff, and I have to say that Brendan in particular and VCS in general uh, have been uh, a remarkable constant. Um, Brendan talked about stories. And uh, you know, you look, at, you look at some of these stories that occasionally they make it to the paper. You hear these conservation victories. Uh, and it's really only the tip of the iceberg that you get to read. Uh, you don't have to dig very deep. You don't have to scratch very far uh, before you uncover Brendan O'Neill and a decade or two of his labors in many, many of these, in many of these efforts. And so uh, in spite of all the sort of flux in personnel, and I, I need to actually do this while I'm babbling, all the flux in personnel, all the loss in, in institutional memory, uh, all the reinventing of the wheel, all that bad stuff. Um, uh, Brendan really has been a, a, um, a central figure, and BCS has too. There aren't any other organizations out here that are afraid, to, that aren't afraid to, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. BCS t uh, walks the walk in addition to talking the talk. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and uh, Brendan, I can honestly say that were it not for you, I would be even more cynical than I am now. <laughs> so, um, on that note, I want to say that everything I'm about to talk about, that in light of Phil's <coughs> earlier presentation on sea level rise, Everything that I'm going to discuss today is completely irrelevant. Um, so when Brendan asked me to, to, to speak at this, um, uh, I asked him sort of broad, in a broad brush way what kind of themes he wanted me to touch on. And uh, you know, we talked about uh, elaborating a little bit on uh, a little blurb I'd written for the VCS newsletter on, on diversity in Moship Trail. I'm not actually going to talk about Moship Trail too much specifically. In fact, there are a whole lot of things that I'm not going to get to, about a million of them. Um, Moship Trail, Fire Ecology, you name it. Uh, but I want to encourage people to ask me anything you want, uh, either after the talk, if there's time, or outside, or whenever, or send me hate emails, whatever you want. Um, if, uh, if there's something I don't get to that you have a question on that I may or may not be able to answer. Um, so elaborating a little bit on, on biological diversity and in particular how I see it as an entomologist, as I see it as someone who works on uh, a very diverse group of organisms, um, essentially my emphasis uh, is going to be that our natural areas and our landscapes are more complex, more diverse, and more fragile uh, than many of us uh, give them credit for, than many of us understand. Um, and so what I want to do is, art, is uh, articulate um, a bit of a rationale at first, it just in the first few slides, of uh, you know, reasons why we want to safeguard our natural areas in general before I move uh, to the topics that are, that are more vineyard specific. Um, it's been my experience that uh, the less we articulate why we do what we do and the less well we articulate it, uh, the easier it is for folks to get the wrong impression about conservation. Uh, and in particular, what that means is, I don't know, thinking about conservation in terms of animal rights or uh, thinking about conservation as just sort of general, uh, I don't know, tree huggery. Um, or worse, thinking of conservation uh, as a luxury uh, or as some, something that's somehow uh, in conflict with, with our economic well-being. Uh, or thinking that conservation uh, or begins and ends with uh, listed species. There are a great many oversimplifications out there, and I'd like to clarify just one or two of them if I could. My purpose here is kind of insidious. What I'm trying to do is arm you with as many arguments as I can so that if you encounter these things as you go out into the world, you, uh, you can discuss them and discuss them um, with some examples. Um, okay. Um, diversity proper. Well, you know, the, the diversity of life on Earth is, of course, enormous, uh, and many people are surprised at how little we understand about it. Um, we don't know to within an order of magnitude how many species there are of, on this planet. And we're pretty sure, in spite of that, that uh, they are disappearing uh, more quickly than they can be discovered and described 
uh, and studied certainly more quickly than they can be prospected for uh, medical uses, for example, or even agricultural uses. Uh, and we see this as a, as a potentially pretty enormous problem. Um, I guess, you know, as, a, as, a, as an entomologist, of course, uh, entomologists love to brag about the fact that most, uh, most you know, multicellular organisms are insects, at least most described, uh, most described forms of multicellular uh, life are insects. Um, but it's really not just about numbers, and I sort of want to get away from uh, just the lists if I could. Um, what I do want to talk about is the processes that generate uh, this diversity uh, just a little bit. Uh, don't be intimidated by the busyness of, of some of these slides. Some of it's just cartoons and pretty pictures and I'll gloss over them. And if there are any other busy slides, I'll point to the parts that matter. Um, we are just now developing the tools to connect the dots between such things as, for example, the history of how uh, flowering plants are related, the evolutionary history of flowering plants, the evolution of their biochemical pathways, the evolution of the insects that drove the evolution of those biochemical pathways. Uh, so we are a long way off, even though we're able now to start developing the tools that will help us predict where we might find, for example, the next anti-cancer drug, we are a long way off. We do know that these processes take hundreds of millions of years, uh, or at least in the case of flowering plants and insects, at least 130 million years. But that's an awful long time, and it's an awful lot longer than it takes to destroy them. Um, we know that extinction does not occur one, occur one species at a time. Extinction occurs in spasms, and it doesn't take a meteor to do it, like the one that knocked out the dinosaurs and essentially enabled our rise. Um, Extinction occurs in spasms and pulses uh, as a result of uh, basic habitat destruction. And we are in the midst of what is considered one of the sixth most massive uh, mass extinctions uh, in the Earth's history. One that's comparable in scale or will, will have been comparable in scale to the one uh, pictured here. Um, all of this is amplified not just by sort of the wanton destruction of habitat, the sort of active denuding of habitat, scraping it off the face of the planet and so forth, but by fragmentation. And this is what really presents a challenge uh, to us conservationists. Um, evolution and specifically natural selection, and this will be the only sort of evolutionary, well, it won't be the only, but it'll be one of the only evolutionary tidbits that I delve into. Evolution operates or natural selection operates when population sizes are large. When population sizes are small, genetic drift takes over. So it is not sufficient simply to take a Noah's Ark approach, uh, even if we could, even if we had a list of all the bazillions of species there are and could pair them off two by two, it would not make sense to try to do that. We need to protect large areas, we need to sustain large populations of things if we want these processes to continue. And so rather than operate opportunistically, which we've had to do out of necessity, okay, by sort of identifying an area uh, that's, that can be conserved and preserving it and sort of drawing a circle around it or building a fence around it and saying, okay, that's a wildlife preserve and then moving on. Now we're faced with the challenge of coordinating our conservation efforts and coordinating our management. And that's something that's actually beginning to happen on the vineyard. Uh, it's beginning to happen among the different land holding organizations. We have a long way to go, however. So what I want to do, having um, sort of contextualized this a little bit, is to um, paint a picture of the vineyard uh, as, it's, as it continues to change. And what I want to do, and the way I want to do this is I want to basically look at two groups of insects that I happen to study uh, to, um, to illustrate this. Um, what I'm going to do is look at uh, bees and moths, um, which are interesting not just for biological reasons, not just by virtue of their being pollinators or by being or herbivores, uh, but because we happen to know an awful lot about them here on the island, and that's a rare thing indeed. Um, so what I'll do is begin by talking about a few of the organisms that are no longer with us. Uh, these are animals that have disappeared from Martha's Vineyard uh, within the last generation or two. Most of the people in this room, including myself, are old enough to remember several of these animals occurring on the island. Okay. And at the same time, I want to talk about some of the animals that are still here, uh, but have undergone enormous declines elsewhere in the region, either entirely from New England or, or at least that are holding on in, on mainland New England just in one or two places. Uh, and so 
Um, these are the things that really make the vineyard special and force us to ask the question, why are these things holding on here on the island and on some of the other islands, but getting wiped out in other places? And the, and the reasons are many and, uh, and varied. Uh, along the way, I'll point to a couple of sort of signature examples of some of our more special habitats, uh, and you'll recognize them um, when I do. Um, as good a place or as good an organism to start off to launch this uh, as any uh, is the regal fritillary. Um, 25 years ago, uh, there were five populations of this animal left in New England. It had already gone, undergone a massive decline. All five of them were confined to the offshore islands. And uh, this is one of those, uh, this is one of, an example of one of those animals that uh, although it, uh, the islands acted as a, a, refu a refuge or a refugium for them, uh, it was really just a delayed response. And one by one, these populations uh, winked out. We watched it happen. Uh, the, um, the animal itself, the butterfly, and this has been called a, a poster child for invertebrate conservation. I think I, I referred to it that way. Uh, it's been also been called North America's most beautiful butterfly. Uh, this is a really conspicuous animal, okay? And it's associated with open habitats, and I'm going to return to these uh, at the end of the talk. Um, in particular, uh, very grassy habitats where bird's foot violet grows. Its caterpillar only feeds on bird, bird's foot violet. Um, but what's interesting about this animal is, uh, is kind of a common pattern. Yes, we, it was very conspicuous and we watched it disappear. What we didn't necessarily notice were all the other things that were disappearing in roughly the same time frame, okay? Including uh, the other four species of fritillary butterflies that occur in the vineyard. So um, there's a, a, a bigger picture and you don't have to scratch too deeply to find it. Um, okay, uh, second example. You'll, you recognize the piping plover, uh, also known as the eastern spotted owl. Um, this, this, animal, this animal is at once you know, the most beloved and reviled creature uh, on the vineyard. Reviled because, and elsewhere, reviled because as a federally endangered species, uh, it entails mandated protection. It, it, it involves, it, its protection involves mandated restriction, I should say, on uh, certain human activities on beaches. Uh, that includes not just uh, you know, development activities, um, although those less so, shoreline development, jetties, revetments, and so forth, but in particular, uh, the use of off-road vehicles. Those are seasonal restrictions, and many people are very irate that they can't drive on beaches during the nesting season of the piping plover and other shorebirds. Um, I, wanna, if I, I, I show this uh, slide for one reason and one reason only, and that is to point out that the piping plover is a seasonal resident. Um, when the chicks are fledged, the off-road vehicle restrictions are lifted uh, and the birds migrate. Um, it is, however, not the only associate of the beach, uh, and certainly uh, there are some that live here all year round. This is one. This is the northeastern beach tiger beetle. Uh, this picture does not do it justice. Those little lines on its back, which we call lunules, are actually iridescent green. It's a fast little guy. These are gorgeous, gorgeous animals. and uh, I should just um, say that in 1902, this animal was described as occurring in great swarms on Martha's Vineyard, from Martha's Vineyard south to Chesapeake Bay. This is a cartoon of its historical range. You see a little star on Nantucket where it was actually the first insect described as, having, as occurring there by Harris in 1842. It isn't there anymore, by the way. Uh, you see a little star on Nantucket, you see, or on, on the vineyard rather, you see a little star on Horseneck Beach. Uh, it was in all of these places, um, and here in red are the places where it has been wiped out uh, from. Um, the vineyard is the only uh, native population left in New England, uh, left north of New Jersey, and I have my doubts about that one in the wake of Sandy. Um, the population on Horseneck Beach disappeared a couple of years ago. There is an artificial population which came from vineyard stock, which we introduced uh, to Monomoy not long ago, uh, that successfully took. Um, but this animal is incredibly fragile. The reason it's incredibly fragile is that it lives in the sand as a larva, and it does so for two years. So this is a dangerous place to be if you're a little tiny beetle grub. And you can imagine uh, why these things, and these are amazing animals. You can go on YouTube and see all kinds of crazy videos of them, of them hunting and stuff. Uh, they're, just, they're just awesome animals. Um, but uh, they're also very fragile. They are very vulnerable to storms, but storms don't wipe them out. Storms can wipe out 90% of a population, as happened here in Hurricane Bob in 1991. 
but the beetles take advantage of the habitat opened up by the storms. The kind of uh, habitat destruction that these things actually ac absolutely cannot abide is the kind of chronic disturbance that comes from vehicle use. Now, I go on this little mini rant not to wag my finger at, at, at surf casters or anything like that. I'm trying to point out here that uh, there is a bigger picture and that invertebrates are important to our understanding of that bigger picture, not just by virtue of their diversity, but by virtue of their vulnerability to environmental change and their sensitivity to environmental change. Uh, and also to point out that um, they indicate a, um, uh, a larger suite that may be less conspicuous. Like the regal fritillary, the tiger beetle is a pretty conspicuous animal. Uh, there are tiger beetle collectors out there because there are about a thousand species of tiger beetles worldwide and some of them are really pretty. And so we, we keep an eye on these things and we can track them. Um, but there are many other animals associated with these undisturbed habitats that aren't necessarily as well known. And that's because there are about 27 of us in the world that know how to tell them apart. Um, <laughs> having said that, um, beaches are an unappreciated habitat. Um, you won't find the tiger beetle on Nantucket anymore. You won't find it on the Cape anymore. Uh, you will find it in what some, on what some consider the last ecologically intact beach in New England, which is here on the vineyard. Um, third example, one of my personal favorites, the imperial moth. This is an example of something that uh, we think um, we can pin, we, can, we think we can, uh, it's another example of something we can probably attribute to human uh, activity. Um, this is an, a very widespread animal. Um, it ranges uh, technically from Canada to Argentina, so it's very, very common down south. But in the Northeast, it, like a lot of very large moths, underwent an enormous decline. Uh, its sole remaining population was here in the vineyard, where it's quite common, actually. It feeds on pitch pine, not exactly a rare plant. Um, you know, when I was studying this thing as, uh, in college, um, I assumed, and not just assumed, I'd done a little homework, um, that one of the reasons, or that a couple of the reasons this thing had disappeared uh, had to do with uh, a combination of uh, the predominance of outdoor lighting, which became very popular. This thing vanished essentially in the 50s and 60s, and pesticide spraying. And I found some data that suggested that uh, DDT spraying on the vineyard was a little less intensive than it was uh, in other counties uh, in the state. Uh, and that was, you know, sort of a passably plausible uh, explanation, but it, still it wasn't very satisfying. And I think there's an emerging consensus that uh, a bigger culprit, or as big a culprit, at least in combination with outdoor lighting and in combination with um, pesticide spraying, uh, was um, this hideous creature, uh, this fly known as Compsolora consonata, which was actually introduced beginning in the early 1900s to combat gypsy moths. There's only one problem. Gypsy moths come out in the midsummer and they overwinter as eggs. Meanwhile, the fly is still flying around looking for something to eat. And it colonized hundreds of native moths and did so very successfully. And so all of a sudden, over, well not all of a sudden, over a period of decades, depending on how rapidly it spread, we note the decline of a number of very large moths, some of which, incidentally, happen to still be very common on the vineyard. And it may be um, that this fly, for whatever reason, simply hasn't taken here. Um, I don't have an explanation for that. I've been looking into it and got a whole bunch of fly data. I can't find the thing. Um, if that's the case, that's the case, and it's very interesting. But it's an, ex it's an example of how, uh, of an unforeseen consequence of a, of a biocontrol effort just gone completely awry. Um, last example of something that, uh, th in this case, is no longer here. Um, a couple of bumblebees. Um, as I'll talk about in a minute, we have precious little historical information about the bees um, on the vineyard. Um, this is one of them. Uh, this is uh, the rusty patched bumblebee. Uh, it was seen here as recently as 1993 in Aquinnah, what was then Gayhead. Uh, and uh, there's a record from Long Point from 1987. But in all the work I've done uh, on bees, uh, and this was one of the things I targeted, uh, we haven't found it. Um, likewise, we didn't find uh, Bombus terricola, this yellow-banded bumblebee. Uh, we actually did turn up a couple of historical records of this thing from the vineyard going back to the 30s and the 50s. Um, and each of these has undergone a ma massive declines uh, in the Northeast. Well, it turns out that uh, an unfriendly little pathogen uh, came in on the backs of 
bumblebees that were introduced to greenhouses for greenhouse pollination of tomatoes and other things. So this is another example of just an unforeseen thing. I mean, who would have thunk it uh, that you know, just something as innocuous as bringing in um, bumblebees for tomato pollination could somehow infect native populations of bumblebees and cause their demise? And that appears to have been the case. Uh, this is one of the things uh, that occasioned uh, my interest in uh, kickstarting this pollinator project, which we did in, in 2010. And that was a, and is uh, an initiative to understand the pollinators of the vineyard, and particularly the bees, um, because we simply didn't know very much about them. One of the reasons I wanted to do this was, of course, to see if there were things like the rusty patch bumblebee hanging out, just as there had been so many other moths and other insects. Uh, despite uh, mainland declines. Um, but there were a couple of other reasons. Um, and you, many of you have heard of the uh, pollinator crisis or the honeybee crisis. I want to differentiate between the two of those. The honeybee crisis, which is, uh, you hear about ubiquitously in the newspapers because it hasn't quite yet been figured out, uh, has to do with colony collapse disorder, which is the sudden disappearance of bees from their hives and the sudden die-off of honeybees from their hives. Uh, there is an emerging... Uh, marginally supported consensus that uh, pesticides have something, a particular class of pesticides may have something to do with this, but the jury is still out. It's probably a number of factors. Um, the question here is whether or not these kinds of things are affecting not just native, or not just uh, uh, exotic honeybees, and I remind everybody that honeybees are not native, not just managed uh, bees, but are native bees as well, and there are many, many, many species of native bees. Um, the problem is that we really don't have a means necessarily of gauging that. Um, I got uh, drafted into uh, participating in the, the writing of this report by the NRC on the status of pollinators in North America in 2006. And I was brought in, uh, not as a bee person obviously, uh, because I'm, I, I consider calling myself a bee person an insult to bee people. Um, I'm a moth guy, I was brought in as a moth guy and as a, an invert conservation guy. Uh, and so I took away much more than I contributed to this, this project. And one of the things I took away from it uh, was uh, the idea that we simply don't have the baseline to evaluate how serious this problem is. And of course I thought of the vineyard. Um, I want to emphasize a couple of things about bees because um, their biology really lends itself to uh, viewing the world through a different lens, if you will. Um, you know, I, I could spend a lot of time, and I will, at least a little bit of time, talking about moths and articulating why I think they're really cool and nifty and all that. And, uh, and folks tend to nod their heads politely and say that's nice. Uh, and when I start talking about bees, and again, I discovered this fairly late in life, uh, people just light up. I mean, it's like I'm talking about flying teddy bears. Uh, they, it's, it's absolutely amazing. There's a certain charisma to them. Uh, and so I want to I wanna, um, talk about that for a little bit. Um, but honeybees in particular, and the distinction between honeybees and native bees uh, is important. Um, native bees, you know, honeybees are, are great. It, you know, if you, you need them if you're going to make honey. Uh, if you're operating a farm uh, at an industrial scale that requires honeybee pollination, you, you know, if you're an almond farmer in California or an almond grower in California, or if you're farming apples uh, at a huge scale in, in upstate New York someplace, uh, you're sort of duty bound to truck in uh, bazillions of, of honeybees uh, to take care of your pollination. But in most of New England, um, where our farms are um, smaller and more diverse, um, we can rely more heavily, potentially at least, on native bees. Um, native bees tend to be more uh, efficient uh, pollen gatherers. Honeybees tend to be more smash and grab pollen gatherers. Uh, and so for, for native crops, there are many like blueberries that we can rely on, on native bees for. As far as wild plants go, of course, uh, honeybees aren't all that efficient. In fact, they can be kind of aggressive competitors with, with native bees. Um, this is not to say any, this is not to be negative about honeybees. It's just to point out that uh, introducing lots and lots of honeybees isn't necessarily benign. Uh, but there are things we can do to encourage uh, uh, native bees in our own backyards that will have off-site impacts and positive ones. Um, in addition to bees that actually pollinate things, whether they're crops or wildflowers, there are bees that pollinate absolutely nothing at all. And these are parasitic bees. And when you say the word parasite, people usually say, ew, that's icky. But these are actually very, very interesting and they're actually very important. Uh, instead of, and you'll notice they look like wasps, that's because they're not fuzzy. The reason they're not fuzzy is because they're not gathering pollen. 
um, and that the reason they're not garrying pollen is because they're stealing it from the provision nests of other bees. Okay? That's why they're parasitic. As such, these guys are basically the top of the bee food chain. And that means that they're wonderful indicators of the health, of the overall health of the assemblage of bee species that are out there. So there are many of us who believe that if you've got a healthy stock of parasitic bees out there, that's an indication that you've got a healthy stock of your underlying pollinators. Um, so just a quick run through of uh, some of the numbers, uh, because I think they're fun, um, of what we did in this, in this bee inventory. Uh, this is um, a sort of a map of how we, we carpet bombed the island with all these little bee traps. Uh, our, our tactic was um, essentially, uh, and again, this was done um, with the help of a great many people, including uh, you know, folks like uh, VCS, uh, the Trustees of Reservations, under whose auspices this was undertaken, um, the, the Nature Conservancy, the Land Bank, all of whom allowed us access to their properties, uh, and a host of volunteers. And we, and we ran around not just with nets catching every bee we could find, uh, maybe being a little more selective than that, um, but setting out these little fluorescent painted souffle cups, which we then, as, we, as they trap bees, I take them back to the lab and process them, and I pr ended up processing something like 15 or 20,000 uh, bees, which then have to be looked at under the microscope and labeled and all that. Um, Nantucket, this is where we're kind of coming up short. Nantucket, there had been a study published in 1930 of insects of Nantucket, which included uh, historical records of 57 bee species. For the vineyard, we had 14. And I found this very embarrassing, since I, too, had been a summer kid here since the age of one and hadn't really contributed all that much. So this was, in a way, kind of me overcompensating uh, for, for all of that. By the end of um, 2013, or by March of this year, we were up to 184 species. Uh, to, to put that in, uh, don't, don't be, it's not the numbers, it's not the numbers. It's about the content and the composition. Um, yes, but it is kind of a cool number anyway. Um, <laughs> It's cool because it represents a little over half of the known bee fauna of Massachusetts. And that again points to the fact that the vineyard is an unusual place. There aren't too many hundred areas that are 100 square miles in size where you get this kind of diversity. If you look at the ants, and uh, I, would, I would sort of mention uh, Aaron Ellison's work on Nantucket and elsewhere, Aaron Ellison at Harvard Forest um, uh, has done a great deal of work on ants. Uh, way back when in the 90s, Stefan Cover and I did a, a sort of bunch of ad hoc work on the vineyard on ants, and about two-thirds to three-quarters of the New England fauna of ants are here on the island. So it's an enormous, enormously interesting place. Um, just one highlight, uh, we were looking for things that might be lingering here uh, that were interesting. We found some. Uh, this is one. This is Walsh's Digger Bee. Uh, this hadn't been seen east of Ohio since the 1970s. Um, it's here. It's in the state forest. Two locations, at least, at least that I found, where it appears to be very, very fond of wild indigo. Uh, and in particular, in 2011, which was a banner year for wild indigo in the state forest, uh, these things were, were uh, readily found. This is a really, uh, a really interesting animal. Um, there are a few things, a few more things about bee biology that sort of lend themselves to uh, uh, shedding light uh, on our landscapes and actually give us a few tips about what we can do to help them. One of them is the fact uh, that many of them are soil nesters. Um, what this means is that if you want to encourage bees, and there are many, many books on this and websites, and I'm happy to uh, encourage people and show people how to, how to access those, uh, that, that tell people how to manage bees or manage four bees in their own backyards. Uh, earlier it was mentioned, you know, plant, planting native plants. Terry mentioned planting native plants. Um, native nectar sources, native pollen sources. Um, you know, a little bare ground doesn't hurt. Bare soil, bare mineral soil, is not necessarily barren soil. And uh, leaving bare soil actually encourages some of these pollinators, which are actually having an impact uh, far, far afield. Um, just to give you an idea, and I won't belabor some of these annoying, uh, crazy colored graphs, uh, all this illustrates is that about 3 quarters of our bee fauna are soil nesters as opposed to twig nesters or wood nesters or hive nesters and so forth. Um, I mentioned parasitic bees before. Nearly a quarter of our fauna, 24% of our bees are parasitic. Um, and that's pretty good. Uh, you know, the other numbers that I've seen uh, you know, may approach that over many, many, many years of sampling. Uh, but really to encounter this kind of numbers after just uh, two in really intensive years of work uh, is impressive. So 
we have the tools here. We have the faunistic tools here to rely on bees uh, a little more heavily than we, or na on native bees a little more heavily than we do now, I think. And there is a possibility that the vineyard can actually set an example for how to go about doing or incorporating this kind of information and how we go about doing sustainable agriculture. At least that's my very naive pipe dream. Um, flower specialists, and I want to use this as my sort of tie-in to going back to the, the moths and butterflies. Um, not all bees are generalists. Not all bees are social. Many of them are solitary uh, and specialized on a particular plant or, or genus of plants. Um, we have a bunch of those. I broke these down by town. This is almost certainly an artifact of where I did most of my work. Um, but I, I live in West Tisbury, so I'm, I kind of want to just, you know, plug it. Um, West Tisbury and Egertown and Aquina, of course, have the greatest floral diversity. It's no surprise that they have the greatest number of bees, the highest number of bees that are, that are flower specialists. Um, just as bees are, you know, have a conspicuous role in the environment, um, butterflies and moths have, have one too. Um, but before I get to that, you know, I, I need to mention uh, their sort of broader relevance as, as, just as a scientist, my interest in them uh, derives from the fact that they represent the largest radiation of herbivorous animals on the planet. These go back to the dawn of the flowering plants. They go back 130 million years, and they have co-evolved with flowering plants for all that time. That means a lot. Uh, they've also co-evolved with a few other things, uh, if not co actively co-evolved, at least um, evolved in response to a few other things. Uh, among their roles in the environment, they grow birds. Uh, birds are, uh, you know, caterpillars are a very important uh, food for birds. If you're a caterpillar, your mission in life, other than growing up and making more caterpillars, is to not look like a caterpillar. It's to look like a snake or a puppy dog or whatever that is. I don't know, but something with eyes that's, that's scary. Uh, all of these are caterpillars or chrysalids of, of butterflies and moths uh, in Costa Rica that Dan Jansen uh, published in a recent review. Um, I have to mention this, in order, and this is venturing into the even more esoteric, but I want to mention it because it is vineyard re uh, relevant. Um, moths, of course, as adults, are a primary food, if not the primary food, for many, many bats. Um, Bats have evolved the ability to hear things, and moths have, or, or, or to, to you know, echolocate, I should say. Moths have evolved the ability to detect sonar, all right? <laughs> the oldest fossil owlet moth, uh, it's, it's actually an egg. Owlet moths are one of the big group of moths, groups of moths that can hear bats. It was actually discovered in the Aquina Cliffs, and this was published in 1980. Now, if that's what it is, because telling a 60 million year old egg, one 60 million year old insect egg from another is kind of a tall order. And frankly, I'm a little skeptical. But if that's what it is, it's interesting because it pushes the known age of bats back about 20 million years. So that's cool. Um, unlike bees, we actually know something about what the vineyards moth and butterfly fauna looked like way back uh, in the early part of the 19th, or the 20th century rather, and that's thanks uh, to this gentleman, Frank Morton Jones. Um, and he did a pretty amazing thing. He, uh, he, he collected the vineyard for many, many years, and along with Charles Kimball, um, uh, published the Lepidoptera of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. And so we have a little bit of a baseline here. Um, many of the animals that they picked up, and many that I and others have picked up since, and uh, you know, are, are considered regionally rare. Tim, or uh, Brendan O'Neill uh, earlier mentioned um, our meeting, I guess, back in 1986 uh, when, I when I first started working with, uh, with Tim Simmons, who uh, sort of grabbed me by the scruff of my neck because he heard I, I liked moths uh, and knew a little bit about them. I think Gus Ben David told him that. Um, and so we began uh, doing this work, and it has turned into a, it has spawned many little projects and some somewhat larger projects characterizing the fauna of the island. Um, so sure, we found plenty of things that Joan didn't, uh, not for lack of trying, and we've also failed to find a lot of things that, that he found. So there has been some faunal turnover, which I'll, I'll talk about. What's uh, another important thing that's happened uh, since the time of Jones and beginning, actually, I guess it was 1991 or 1992, was that Massachusetts passed the Endangered Species Act, uh, which now lists 46 species of moths and butterflies. Now, the uh, Endangered Species Act in Massachusetts, uh, I'll go back. 
Um, the Endangered Species Act in Massachusetts is considered one of the strongest uh, acts in the country, at least for the time being. There's a concern that it's going to be eroded uh, shortly. Um, and, uh, and there are an awful lot of misconceptions about it that I, I want to talk about a little bit. You see, a, you, you know, if you live on the vineyard or if you visit the vineyard with any regularity at all, you're familiar with uh, bumping elbows with state-listed animals and plants, certainly state-listed moths. Um, I want to emphasize a couple things. Um, first of all, the vineyard, and this is a, I guess you could consider it either a declassified document or a document that conveys little enough information to be, to be too sensitive. But the vineyard down here, you can see, has the highest concentration of state-listed moths and butterflies of anywhere in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so we have, a, we have quite a few. That's not all my fault. Um, <laughs> some of it is. Um, but you would be amazed at how conservative uh, we are about listing. Um, I, uh, at this point, am, am pushing to reconsider and delist a number of things. We've delisted several. Um, we, we need to be very, very mindful of, of, how, uh, of the criteria we use to list stuff. We can't do this frivolously because it's an enormous burden and it attracts a lot of attention when people don't understand it. Um, every one of these animals has a story and I won't, you know, go through all of them obviously, but I'll go through a couple really, really, really quickly. Um, this, is, this is an animal that we didn't even know was on the vineyard until uh, 2010 when I picked it up for the first time. It's one I'd always looked for and hoped for, uh, but now we have not one but two populations in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, those are the only two populations north of New Jersey. Uh, this animal has disappeared from 95% of the places where it was once known and 100% of the places where it was known prior to 1968. It's associated with wetlands in Sandy Pine Barrens. Uh, it's a gorgeous little animal uh, and it probably is an indicator of uh, uh, it uh, it co-occurs with a number of other things that we don't even know about, but its habitat is very specific. Uh, this is an animal I had to throw up just because it occurs right over there. Um, that's the, uh, or at least it used to. Um, the uh, cotton grass bog or the cranberry bog over there is home to a fair amount of water willow. And this is actually, uh, as far as I know, this is Massachusetts only known described endemic insect. Its world distribution looks like this. It only occurs on the Cape and Islands region. It doesn't even get into Rhode Island. It's a snob. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a glacial relic. It's here. Um, it's a wetland associate. It's a really, really interesting animal. This is actually, this, this belongs to a genus that I, I did my dissertation work on. Um, here's an animal that I, I throw up uh, because it's um, uh, associated with Moshe Trail. Uh, Moshe Trail is, it, it, the population in, in Aquina is the only population, the living population we know of in Massachusetts. Uh, there may be others, but I don't know about them. Uh, it's not listed. Uh, there are many, many, many things like this that, are on, that only have one population in the state that aren't listed just because, you know, you can't, you have to, as I said, you have to be very, very circumspect uh, in what we, we put on state list or what we recommend for it. But it's a beautiful creature. It's a, it's a flagship animal. I'm not sure it should be listed. It's in Aquina. It's always been in Aquina. Uh, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, um, so if there's not an imminent threat, I'm not sure there's, there's cause. Um, you know, before I get there, you know, I, I've mentioned that uh, on the topic of listing, um, I, I don't think there's a more misunderstood topic in conservation. Maybe there is, um, but uh, it, it's really an issue, um, and uh, I don't want to uh, dwell on it too much, but yes, there are a lot of folks who uh, either are of the impression that, uh, you know, conservation begins and ends with state listed or federally listed species and endangered species, and that's a mistake. Uh, the purpose of listing actually is to delist something. There's a very zen-like quality to the whole thing, uh, but it's it really, uh, the purpose is to, is to protect these things and to protect their habitats. And so each of these is thought to be uh, is listed for the purpose, for a larger purpose, even if the wording of the legis, even if that's not completely transparent in the wording of the legislation. Um, it's unfortunate that a lot of these uh, sort of misunderstandings get perpetuated. Uh, some of them get perpetuated in, you know, kind of superficially innocuous uh, articles uh, like this one that are nonetheless a little bit misleading. Um, and what's unfortunate is that the overall message, the message that 
No, the government is not out to micromanage how many cockroaches you step on in your basement. Uh, the government is not, you know, there's not a big conspiracy to, to overregulate people or extort money from them in fees or anything like that. Uh, the, the, uh, the state agency, the uh, um, Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program that has to deal with these things looks forward to nothing less uh, than um, uh, a greater regulatory burden. And so, uh, for example, the imperial moth, which is figured here, uh, is actually a big problem because there's only one population left and it's on the vineyard, but it's common here. Do you think they want to have to go out and uh, you know, micromanage and regulate how many pitch pine trees people cut down? Certainly not. So there's a lot of room for fine tuning. Um, and uh, it's worth a discussion. I think the discussion should be more um, transparent. Um, this particular site happens to be one of uh, my favorites. Uh, it's in the state forest, Willow Tree Bottom. Many of you will recognize it as right near the big hook in the bike trail. Uh, this site actually supports, uh, partly by virtue of, of all the moths that are there, the highest concentration, site-specific concentration, of state-listed animals and plants uh, in all the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that's, that's, that's the crown jewel right there. Um, but there are many others, and Moshe Trail is one of them. Um, I, point, I use this, this slide to point out, this is taken, well, there's even a timestamp on it. This is taken at four in the morning um, a year ago, uh, or almost, I think there was daylight savings error there. But anyway, um, you know, what you see is a whole bunch of different habitats sort of munged together here. Something else that happens on Moship Trail, which accounts for all the different assemblages of animals that occur there. Uh, and um, this is a property, this is a site that really exemplifies uh, the vineyard sand plain. And I want to spend the last bit uh, of my talk focusing on the sand plain and what some of the animals can t and, and what some of these animals can tell us about it. Um, and uh, you know, I use sand plain. I use sand plain in, a, in the broad sense. Sand plain meaning any sandy soils. Uh, but on the vineyard, it's important that we distinguish between sand plain and outwash plain. And I'm, what I'm really talking about is this big yellow part, this big yellow central part of the island that's, that we call outwash plain. Um, that's the result of basically the glaciers washing through uh, the moraine and depositing all the sand and gravel. Um, so earlier, uh, you, you remember in Phil's talk, he talked about, uh, he called them tentacles coming off the great ponds, being old ancient meltwater channels. Well, the extensions of those old ancient meltwater channels, if we can go back, form these frost bottoms. These are basically ghost rivers. Uh, of fog that are going through these little meltwater channels and these create in really, really important microenvironments for a lot of uh, different insects, a lot of different plants. Um, these things can freeze up to 12 months a year. Um, I used to keep a little max min thermometer in this one uh, and got some pretty, pretty wacky uh, readings. Um, but uh, the outwash plain in particular is of interest to us because as conservationists we're faced with the challenge of trying to manage uh, an inherently dynamic place and one that changes really, really quickly, okay? And there are many different components to it. Um, I said I'd return to this animal and its habitat and now I'm doing that. Um, the regal fritillary is considered to be an associate of what we call sand plain grasslands. Uh, and these really have been kind of at the focus uh, of a lot of discussion about what our priorities should be in terms of management and management goals uh, on the sand plain, on the outwash plain in particular. Um, the thing about sand plain grasslands is that they host a tremendous concentration of regionally rare, threatened native uh, plants and animals. But as grasslands in this configuration, which is basically treeless and shrubless, they're essentially man-made. They're anthropogenic. Uh, they are pretty much post-agricultural. Now, if you're interested in protecting uh, assemblages of rare animals and plants, and these are the only places that support them in some cases, well then who cares? We've got to manage these things. Um, however, there are, um, I should say, there's probably, I would call it a triangular discussion about how to think about the different components of the sand plain, and it's my sort of take that the moths and butterflies lend a little bit of, or shed a little bit of light on this. Um, of course, grassland animals and, uh, and plants in particular have uh, changed or disappeared uh, immensely in the last 100, 120, 150 years. Uh, this is a pair of pictures uh, 
that I, I ripped off unceremoniously from an a issue of a, the Journal of Biogeography that David Foster uh, edited a few years back that illustrate uh, the change. There is a, a wonderful book that uh, Brennan was involved in, BCS was involved in, called The Nature of Change that Peter Dunwoody did uh, here on the Vineyard that, that had a, a number of these sort of before and after photos. And unsurprisingly, uh, the butterflies and moths and probably an awful lot of other animals uh, track these changes. Uh, I'll make this brief. Basically, here we have the owlet moths, those things that here uh, on the right and in yellow, those that are associated with grasses. These are the animals that have disappeared since 1943, and that is, trust me, a conservative estimate. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, half the owlet moths that we don't see here anymore that used to be here are associated with grasses. That's kind of interesting. Meanwhile, of the uh, things that are now quite abundant that Frank Morton Jones never saw, most of them are tree foliage feeders. So what we're seeing is turnover. Um, and this is an example of how some of these animals can uh, illuminate um, our recent uh, ecological history. Um, there has been probably no greater harbinger of faunal change on this island than uh, the heath hen. Um, I mean, this animal has really achieved uh, almost mythical status, really, on the island. I mean, there's a plaque um, in the state forest. This is not 100 yards, by the way, from that site that I showed you, the frost bottom with the highest concentration of uh, state-listed animals on the planet. Uh, it's, it's right nearby there. Um, there's a statue, of course, also not far. That's a, what I'm told uh, apparently quite effective. It's scaring horses. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, people come to the rock and they even leave offerings out on it. I've, I've often compared it to the grave of Jim Morrison at Père Lachaise. Um, <laughs> Uh, levity aside, however, uh, this animal, it's important to recognize, was not, did not have the same habitat association as its distant cousin, the prairie chicken. This animal was an associate, or at least tied with habitats, that had a fair amount of scrub oak. Scrub oak uh, is kind of like the piping plover of plants in a way. Uh, it's both beloved and reviled. Um, it is a common plant with an awful lot of uncommon moths associated with it. It's like the universal donor uh, for oak feeding moths. If you can feed on, on oak, you can feed on scrub oak, but if you only feed on scrub oak, no other oak will do. And there are many, many species that are specialized on scrub oak. Um, so it's a common plant with uncommon moths, but uh, so, you know, it, uh, in one sense, it's an important component of the landscape. It's an important host for lots and lots of threatened animals. But if it's not managed uh, correctly, it is an outright enemy of, gr of grassier habitats, and it will choke them out. So how you interpret scrub, scrub oak really depends on the context. And so the nature of this uh, triangular argument, or triangular not argument, nobody's actually discussed it even barely, it's just sort of been indirect, uh, discussion over uh, how to manage these properties has to do with, um, has to do with whether or not first uh, grasslands should be uh, undertake a restoration of grasslands should be undertaken at the expense of shrublands, or if you take a, a, another view that all of these habitats are not native and that we should allow everything to go back to forest. And there are cases that have been made for all of those options. I personally think that there's a fair amount of zoological evidence for, uh, if not shrublands, uh, oak-based systems and um, systems or, or habitats where oak was an important component historically, pre-colonially on the vineyard. And probably the best zoological example I have is this moth. Uh, you, it, you know, its caterpillar is perhaps prettier than the adult, uh, but it really is uh, an interesting thing. It is associated exclusively with these canopy-free scrub oak areas. Uh, and here's the interesting thing, its females don't fly. Uh, which means it got here when Martha's Vineyard was a hill, uh, to, which to me indicates that these habitats uh, existed uh, long before the arrival of, of Europeans. Um, well, uh, what I've tried to do is to sort of um, focus some of our conservation issue through this bizarre lens of mine, this bizarre entomological lens. And if I could, um, I want to just try to mention a, a few summary points. Um, you know, the vineyard landscape uh, does change, it continues to change, uh, and these changes ripple throughout the fauna. They impact the insects. They're not just changes that we can take pictures of and see in a gross sense. Uh, 
Uh, they have impacts that, that we do not see. Um, the consequences of extinction and, and extirpation, uh, extirpation being local extinction, uh, are not always predictable, um, but neither are the consequences of our actions. Uh, if you had told me, as I said 20 years ago, that we would introduce a pathogen that would wipe out native bumblebees, I would have looked at you a little cockeyed. Likewise, if you had told me uh, 20 or 25 years ago that uh, bringing cordwood over that had some caterpillars of an introduced winter moth on it would lead to the denuding of a couple of thousand acres of forest on the vineyard, I also would have looked at you suspiciously. But that's what happened. So we have to think about our activities. We have to think about uh, what we do. We have to think about um, uh, some of the broader implications and not necessarily just uh, uh, in our immediate surroundings. Um, my feeling, and this goes back to the issue of, of listed species, I view species as, as tools, not just as targets for conservation. Uh, the purpose of listing, the purpose of regulation uh, is to try to manage things sensibly and sustainably. I know sustainable is a buzzword, um, and for that reason I, I, I hate using it. Um, but it's an important word, and so um, I'll, I'll leave that at that. Um, Herbivorous insects, and just this is the final point, really do, I think, uh, shed a lot of light, not just the last 130 million years, which, let's face it, who cares, uh, you know, but more practically on, on, on the, the history of our immediate surroundings, just in the last generation or two. Uh, and as we face these enormous challenges of climate change, really, uh, and as we see that a lot of the places I've just talked about are going to change drastically. If you, I mean, the, the phenomenon of frost 12 months a year is going to disappear. Uh, I think it's important to bear these things in mind because, um, you know, we cannot afford to think in terms of freezing things in a static way. I'm going to leave it at that, uh, and I want to acknowledge a great many people who have helped me uh, over the years, uh, and for this talk in particular, and once again, thanks to VCS. Thank you. Thank you.